Good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting us. It was a little deja vu for me to come here today because we had an office just in the basin here where we kept our boats. This building wasn't here with, um, you know, with dirt, and then there was where the parking lot is was the actual chancellor's office. So it was kind of interesting to come back and see such a nice facility. Uh, this morning, Aaron and I are going to touch on who is the MPA Management Project team. I'll highlight briefly uh, the Green Light Protection Act. We'll provide an overview of monitoring and research within California's green protected areas, and also touch on some other management activities, monitoring and research that are running parallel to that effort. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife has been the trustee agency for California's natural resources since 1870. It's divided in the state, they've divided the state into seven components, basically six terrestrial components and one ring component, which I work with. It encompasses over 5,000 square nautical miles along California's 1,100 mile coastline. The jurisdiction extends from the mainland shore out to three miles offshore and three miles around the offshore islands like the Channel Islands, the Farallones, and for the humble people out threading rock, it goes three miles beyond that, that rock off the shore. The MPA program with it that I work in is divided into two components, the statewide monitoring component and our outreach and education part. I supervise six staff that are dedicated. Uh, we all work together on projects, but they're dedicated to specific responsibilities. So I have a couple that work full time on MPA management issues, which involve monitoring and research, developing regulation, uh, reviewing policy information uh, for the director. I have people who work on scientific collecting permits with an emphasis uh, on permits issued for uh, green protected areas. I have a deep water visual survey person who's been doing surveys for a long time and supplementing the baseline monitoring data that we'll be hearing about a little later. Um, and I have an awesome GIS expert who handles all of our geographical information data that was collected during the baseline planning process and the development of the coastwide network. don't know who the California Ocean Science Trust is, so we were actually established by state legislation, the Coastal Ocean Resources and Search Act of 2000. So we're a unique nonprofit here out on the landscape. And we were established to make, to bring independent rigorous science to the state so the state can make decisions about its coast and oceans based on science. So that's our job. Um, and we're a small interdisciplinary team. We have ecologists, oceanographers, social scientists, communications experts, technology experts, and administrative experts as well. So we're a big inter interdisciplinary team, and by big, I mean about 12, basically. <laughs> um, and there were a few of the things that were mentioned earlier that I'm just gonna touch on some of our other roles in the state. We also serve as science advisor to the Ocean Protection Council, which means that we sit and attend and report out to the Ocean Protection Council at each of their meetings. We also convene the Ocean Protection Council science advisory team, of which there are a few members of that group here in the room today. And we also, as science advisor, report out to the Joint Committee of Aquaculture and Fisheries, and that was mentioned by Krista earlier today. And um, I think I'll pause there. We do a lot of different work, but one of our biggest programs is the MPA Monitoring Program. So I'm also going to highlight, if they're not available to be here, the Ocean Protection Council. Uh, they were created in 2004 through the California Ocean Protection Act. Uh, the core responsibility within the realm of the region's protected areas is providing policy oversight, uh, recognizing that MPA management transcends boundaries, geographic boundaries, political boundaries, and sectors. They're very keen in improving communication across agencies and with the public, coordinating, collaborating efforts. They're very big on that. In addition to some of their responsibilities, uh, they do have the Ocean Protection Council Science Advisory Team, and there are a few representatives here, Kevin <coughs> and uh, Steve Murray, uh, that weigh in on issues not just marine protected areas, but uh, they discuss ocean acidification, hypoxia, marine debris. Uh, that group of people also report directly to uh, the state legislature with management recommendations and policy and the governor. So to provide a little bit of background, very briefly, I need to touch on the Marine Life Protection Act of 1999. The Marine Life Protection Act was forward-looking progressive legis legislation uh, at its time when it was implemented. They realized that California's unique biodiversity, habitats, and ecosystems, and the services they provide for Californians and for the ocean health are very important. So they 
decided to uh, have us redesign our existing MPAs, which weren't really a network. They were these hodgepodge, very small areas, usually single species management. The Act also requires that we create an interconnected, cohesive unit of uh, marine protected areas along the entire coast with the uh, goals of focusing on biodiversity, habitats, increasing populations in abundances. There's a few other uh, goals that I won't go into, but there's six specific ones that drive the monitoring and research. It also requires that this network is evaluated on a cyclic value to see if it, if it is functioning as planned to meet the goals of the Act and to inform adaptive management. Uh, this slide here, uh, prior to the redesign of California's network of marine protected areas, about less than 3% of California was in a protected area and less than 1% was in a reserve. Uh, the figure on the left is the current network of marine protected areas along the entire coastline. We ended up with 124 marine protected areas, protecting about 16% of California's coastline with 9% of that area in a state marine reserve. As you, as you may know, this was done in a regional process to be able to handle the entire coastline. So we started uh, on the Central Coast. And by 2007, we completed that portion of the network, moved up the coast to the North Central Coast, completed that in 2010. Then we moved down to Southern California, completed that early 2012, January, and finished up the North Coast in <coughs> late December 2012. And we'll talk about it more in a minute, but essentially, following the planning and implementation of those regions, we start baseline monitoring to characterize what we invested in. The figure on the right basically shows the area that's protected in each one of those regions, the percentage of habitat. Um, the red represents a state marine reserve. It's essentially like a national park. You can't take anything from there. The blue area is a, what we call a, no, I mean a state marine conservation area. That allows limited types of recreational or commercial fishing. The kind of fuchsia color you see up there, that was intended by the stakeholders to be a reserve, part of the backbone of the network. But especially in Southern California, we have a lot of infrastructure, you know, pipelines, uh, seawall protection. But that would result in some type of take to maintain that infrastructure, so we couldn't give it the reserve designation. But all, for all intents and purposes, it is active. Uh, the candy stripe, or the blue and yellow striped uh, legend there is for the only state marine park that we have along the coast. There are some in San Francisco Bay, but this is all focused on the external coastline. And then the green represents what we call a state marine recreational management area, and that only typically allows waterfowl hunting with no take below the sea surface. this topic is on research and monitoring, I just wanted to drill down just a little bit before Aaron provides you with a lot of information. Um, to facilitate adaptive management, the department with our MPA management team, which consists of the Ocean Science Trust and the Ocean Protection Council, have oversight on research, monitoring, and evaluation of California's network. Science is the pillar for determining if the network is being uh, is developed like we expected it to and functioning like it should. The state broke the, mon the management of the monitoring of this effort into two components. One is baseline monitoring, which I'm going to speak about in a minute, that follows immediately upon implementation of the region, and long-term monitoring that is uh, done to evaluate the functionality of the network over time. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to Aaron.
partnership with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, set up a process to come up with and develop an MPA monitoring framework. And it's a science-based framework that we actually developed uh, through a whole series of workshops with scientists, experts from within California and actually across the world um, to really build a framework that's going to meet the needs of the Marine Life Protection Act and help us to meet those goals of the act and to answer these questions, these priority scientific and management questions around the network. So I'm just going to walk you through and orient you to the state's monitoring framework. Um, and you'll see some similar language to um, mon the monitoring work in the MPAs as you saw in Jeff's presentation. So first and foremost, the monitoring framework uh, categorizes MPA monitoring and sums it all up under 10 different what we're calling ecosystem features. Eight of those are ecosystems or actual habitats along our coastline, and two of those are two different categories of human uses. So monitoring that's funded by the state and supported by the state covers both ecological and socioeconomic monitoring. And the framework is broken into two major components, assessing ecosystem conditions and trends, and this is the side of like, the most traditional things that you're thinking of, of actually going out in the water and collecting information and conducting research. But very importantly, one of the things that we recognize at the start of this is one of the reasons why MPA monitoring has failed or is not successful in other places is that it doesn't do the other piece of this. It doesn't actually evaluate the design and management decisions made to set up an MPA system so that you can actually understand whether or not it's meeting those goals. So that's an important and state-recognized component of the monitoring framework. And I'm going to switch to the next slide because we developed kind of an infographic that dives in a little deeper and maybe will help us. So on the assessing ecosystem condition and trend size at side of this, there are two ways to implement that. One is focused more on uh, academic researchers or state or federal agency researchers, those with a little bit more expertise who can go out and collect more detailed information. But also important to point out that another way of getting at ecosystem, assessing ecosystem condition and trends we call a checkup. And this is something that's targeting maybe citizen science groups. So maybe you have an academic researcher partnering with a nonprofit to go out and do monitoring that's bringing other people out into the field. And you can get some of that and answer some of those same questions, but the metrics that you're doing and the people that are out there collecting it are slightly different. Now switching to the other side of the framework, the evaluating design and management around setting up the MPAs. That involves short and long-term questions. So short-term questions, things that can be answered over about a five-year span. Long-term questions, something that takes more than five years to answer. And again, these questions are focused on the design decisions about the network. So questions around connectivity. Questions around, if I set up this reserve in this place and it crosses a reef, so half the reef is inside the MPA and half is not, how can we, can we evaluate or do some research to figure out whether or not we're getting the response from only protecting half a reef, for example. Now this monitoring framework was served as the foundation for developing regional monitoring plans. And so there are regional monitoring plans for three of our coastal regions that are out there in the world for everybody to look at. That includes the North Central Coast region, the Central Coast region, which just went through an update and was uh, re-released October of 2014, and the South Coast Monitoring Plan, which will likely go through an update here um, shortly. The North Coast Plan does not exi yet, exist yet. It's something we'll be developing actually starting later this year, definitely um, starting in 2017. And in these plans, and wanted to bring these up today because in these plans it actually walks through each of those ecosystem features and it calls out the metrics that you need to monitor in order to meet the needs of this program. So if you're looking to align your monitoring or research activities with the need, the state science needs around MPAs, take a look at these plans and it lays out, again, those metrics at those two different levels of a checkup or an assessment. Now, as Steve mentioned earlier, monitoring in the state is done in this two-phased approach. It's baseline monitoring as well as long-term monitoring. Baseline monitoring is well underway and completed in a couple of our regions. So I'll just walk you through so you have an idea. Again, there are many researchers in this room who are participating in that program, but for those of you who are not familiar, the Central Coast Baseline Program has since wrapped up. They wrapped up with the Central Coast Symposium, which maybe some of you were present at back in 2013. 
The North Central Coast uh, Baseline Monitoring Program has just come to a close. Steve's going to talk a little bit more about that next, um, but that just completed literally last week. The South Coast program is moving into its synthesizing and sharing results phase. So data collection is done, um, the data analysis phase, all of that is completed, and we're now working with researchers both within the baseline program and other folks from the South Coast region who are collecting data that can help inform and help us to understand the state of the region. And so that work is going on now with the culmination of a report that will come out this fall and a presentation of the Fish and Game Commission that will happen next year in 2017. And then the final region where the MPAs were completed was the North Coast. That baseline program is still underway. A lot of those researchers are about to embark on their final field season for that work, so we're still in the collecting data phase. Some folks are already analyzing data, and those data and results will start coming in um, this fall and early next year, and then it'll move into these other two phases of synthesizing and sharing results. And the five-year management review for that region is projected to happen in 2018. Now this is not something that we could do alone. So here's another logo soup, soup slide. You've seen one in each presentation. We have, uh, gosh, I wish I could remember the numbers. Um, over 75 different organizations statewide. This is academic institutions. These are nonprofits. These are state agencies, federal agencies, and even some private organizations as well who are partnering to make this monitoring happen. And I also wanted to use this time to also say that the state has invested now $19 million in, in uh, Proposition 84 funds to support MPA monitoring. And also for those of you who don't know, um, the CNRA, the, the California Natural Resources Agency, has secured for us through the legislature $2.5 million of an annual allotment from the general fund that's going to support MPA monitoring. And that first round is coming online just now. So the state is committed to supporting monitoring of our MPA network. And just to highlight the logos on here that are CSU, there are many different academic institutions within the CSU system who are partnering with us on this monitoring. And I understand that several of you will be speaking later this afternoon. And then one of the other questions that came to us from Krista that we wanted to touch on is where do you get access to these data? How do you get access to the reports and the results of this work? This is state-funded data, and thus these data and these reports need to be made publicly available. And we do that through a website called oceanspaces.org. And this website is more than just a data portal. It serves as the online community that tracks the California's health, or the health of California's ocean. So this is a place where you can go to download the data, you can download technical reports, you can uh, explore and read through, uh, gosh, a whole suite of different reports related to MPA monitoring and beyond MPA monitoring. So there is information on here about ocean health more broadly, about water quality, etc. So there are lots of different reports you can find here, but again, the raw data for MPA monitoring are here for you to download if you want to do different analyses or comparative analyses into the future. And we're uh, partnering with a whole slew of folks across the state to start thinking about how to make these data more accessible, more available, more easily discoverable. So over the next year or so, you'll start seeing the appearance on this website of a map-based data discovery tool that'll help you find the data that are of most interest. And we're looking to connect in that tool to other data portals where there are other uh, pieces of information that the state might be interested in, specifically around MPAs. Now that you've heard a little bit about the design process, uh, baseline monitoring plans, uh, baseline programs, and the data collection, um, I also want to speak a little bit about communicating the results. But that, that's what's most important, reaching out to our stakeholders and also getting the messaging to our managers and these decision makers so we can continue to move forward with this program. A good example of this was last week. Mm -hmm. Myself and Dina Leibowitz from Ocean Science Trust went to the commission. Um, the first first step is to take a step back. We looked at the uh, PI's reports and we synthesized that information working with the Ocean Science Trust and the Ocean Protection Council to develop the state of the region report shown there. It was in a couple of other slides that Aaron had. Uh, it summarizes the information from the monitoring. And then 
then the department does an independent review of the results. Uh, the baseline monitor is not, not so much results, but the information that was generated, and we prepare a report for the commission. So Dina and I went to the commission office last week and uh, provided that overview to the commission, and the department did not have any regulatory management changes proposed, but we did have a lot for the NPA program for each of those four components that I spoke about a moment ago. So in the early phase, that's how the data is being used to help inform uh, management as we move forward to the long term. electronically on oceanspaces.org. There's a website that's actually interactive. And important to point out that there are over 20 scientific-based products, um, as well as scientific manuscripts, so actual publications and scientific literature that back up the findings that are expressed in that report. So it's not just a standard report. So also wanted to then nod to the second phase of NPA monitoring. So you saw the baseline is wrapping up or done in a couple of these regions. Long-term monitoring, the state is investing in that. So just wanted to walk you through what our thinking is around that. So the statewide monitoring program will start actually this year with that, some of that uh, initial infusion of funds from the general fund. And also important to say out loud at this point that the NPA management review cycle in the first Marine Life Protection Act master plan set that at five, every five years. That's now shifted to every 10 years with some of that acknowledgement that it's going to take about 10 years to really see those changes. And so we're now on a 10-year management review cycle. So what that means for monitoring is that we're on a 10-year data collection or about a nine-year data collection cycle to then analyze those data to inform that management review. So just something important to keep in mind. And that first management review will happen in 2022, which is the 10-year anniversary of the statewide network. Now, we are also working in close partnership with the department and the Ocean Protection Council to develop the statewide MPA monitoring guidance. This is something that's going to build on the foundation laid by that monitoring framework, those regional monitoring plans and other information to really set up what the state's approach is to evaluating the MPAs at a network. Are there metrics that we can look at at a statewide scale to assess condition or health of kelp forests or beaches or deep e ecosystems that we can then consistently look at those same species? Maybe there aren't, but maybe there are. Are there questions that we want to ask at a statewide scale around connectivity or otherwise? And these metrics, these questions, and other components of this guidance document is something that we're going to be working to develop over the next year. So just stay tuned on that. We'll be reaching out to experts in the field to participate in workshops and et cetera over the coming months. And then just wanted to, recognizing that this afternoon is about uh, all the different monitoring efforts that folks are doing at CSUs, uh, we launched this website, um, and it comes out regionally, focusing on what are the different monitoring activities, data collection activities that are happening across the state. If you're not familiar with this survey tool that was released, it was released for the Central Coast, the North Central Coast, and we're going to release it for the South Coast this summer. So please keep your eye out or shoot me an email. It's still open, so if you did not contribute your monitoring sites and the data that you collect, please do so. The state, together with us, we're using this tool to help us understand what the network of existing programs are in our state, so we, that's actually helping to guide how we fund and look forward to NPA monitoring long term. And just a nod toward um, other types of activities that Ocean Science Trust is involved in. So we convene the West Coast Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Science Panel, which has just come to a close with the release of its executive summary report. Um, one of the reasons why I'm pointing this out here today is because in this document, which lays out some really incredible recommendations and action areas for the state and federal governments across the West Coast that they can take to meet the needs around OA monitoring, or OA in general, one of the themes in here is specifically around monitoring. So again, I have a few copies of this. If you would like, again, to help align your work to, to really inform the science needs of the state and the federal government around climate change, specifically ocean acidification hypoxia, I encourage you to take a look at the report. It's available online, but I also have printed copies if folks want to take one home. In closing, 
Um, as California moves forward with monitoring, management, and enforcement, we need to refer back to the data that was collected for actually designing the network, for um, the baseline data that was collected. That information is going to be used to evaluate functionality in time. Uh, the figure on the right, well, and to discover and review that information, the department developed a program called Green Files. It's a web-based tool. You don't have to be a GIS expert to be able to use it. You can be uh, non-tech savvy. Um, but it allows you to access this information. And the figure on the right is an example of it. During the planning process on the North Central Coast, the Dungeness Crab Commercial Fishermen were asked, well, where are the areas that are most important to you? And they ranked them, which resulted in this, this heat map, where the orange area is the most commonly fished areas, and the lesser uh, intensity is the, when they didn't fish, and they asked the stakeholders, you know, can you put an MPA that has the right type of habitat, but not in fishing grounds? So that's what this tool was used for. But as we move into the future, we'll be able to go back and look to see if the fishing effort shift, it. So um, I highly recommend this tool. If you haven't had a chance to check it, check it out. It's got a lot of bells and whistles. You know, the metadata pops up to the right uh, when you click on you bring up a, a map view a feature. It also you query records, uh, save maps, share them with your colleagues, bookmark maps. Um, I know we don't have internet access here, but I was going to kind of really quickly run you through the program. But um, that's the web address. If you want to bypass that completely, we have all the um, shape files on our GIS website. You can download those, download those and work from those yourself if you feel like you want to be constrained by this, this program. So with that said, uh, Aaron and I thank you for allowing us to be here and we'll be available with the panel in just a minute, I guess.